Our next presentation will be on protected mill satcom, um, and our speaker will be Rick Skinner. So let me change out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Rick Skinner, uh, happy to be here today to talk about some of Northrop Grumman's initiatives in bringing the price of protected SATCOM down to being equivalent to the price of unprotected SATCOM. Uh, I'm not going to say much to you about Valentine's Day today, but I have taken a note to myself to stop at the Hallmark store on the way home because <laughs> I, I didn't realize that uh, that was part of the agenda today. Uh, some of you know that I served 29 years in the Air Force. My last couple jobs uh, at the Air Force were the missionary director for space and nuclear deterrence at the headquarters, Air Force Acquisition, assistant secretary for uh, acquisition. So I've been watching space programs and the ICBM programs of the Air Force for a very long time. Then my very last job, was very similar at, uh, in the OSD staff as the principal director for C4, ISR, and space uh, for the assistant secretary for C3I. And uh, prior to coming to North Grumman, I was at Lockheed Martin, where I worked the TSAT program. Many of you will remember that program, the GPS-3 program, and did some strategy and business development for Lockheed Martin Space Systems a company. So I've been in the space business for about 45 years, and I know I don't look that old. As the title of my presentation today suggests, I'm going to talk about what's underway at Northrop Grumman to address the growing requirements for SATCOM serving the national security mission. Uh, I'd like to point out and thank uh, both uh, my brothers at the aerospace sector's uh, B2 program and uh, the IS program for giving you a perfect preface for my presentation. If you think about the B2 and its long range mission and the Air Operations Center, uh, there's going to be lots of distance between that platform. And that platform is not only a deep penetrator weapons platform, but it's an ISR platform. And the things that tie it together our communications. And as Dave Mazur told you, there is a, a, a aggressive program within the B2 to equip that uh, platform with protected SATCOM that will eventually access our Milstar and advanced DHF products. Uh, but equally important at the Air Operations Center is the, to the need to talk with all the platforms that are being commanded in that, from that command center so that we can synergize the battle space and provide those forces the latest information and, if necessary, change their mission plans to meet the needs of the operational commanders. Obviously, the B-2 can't pull out a cell phone and place a telephone call. They need purpose-built communications that complement their platform and do the job they need to have done, both in getting orders to the cockpit, but also bringing information on mission status back to the Air Operations Center. There's only really one product in the SATCOM business in the, in the Defense Department that meets the need for all threat communications, and that's our EHF product systems. And as Dave said, we've been building the, plat the payloads for Milstar and Advanced EHF for some 32 years. This morning I plan briefly to cover three areas. The need for more SATCOM, the growing threat to our SATCOM capabilities, and the Northrop Grumman approach to meeting the first two needs more affordably. My presentation is really follow on to a press conference that some of you attended on September 26, where we announced a, a new product that Northrop Grumman and its partner companies have developed called the low-cost terminal. This is the terminal piece of the protected SATCOM enterprise. 
And as you'll recall from that uh, press conference and some really good articles that you all contributed uh, about the low-cost terminal, the idea there was is to not do everything that every protected SATCOM terminal needed to do, but to provide those core services that edge users needed. Uh, and we continue with the low-cost terminal program, but that's just one part of the ecosystem. In order to have a SATCOM capability, you need terminals for the users to plug in to the network. You need satellites, you need satellite launch, you need mission control and satellite control on the ground. And so I'm going to talk about the rest of the story. The, we talked about low-cost terminal a couple months ago. I'm going to talk about the rest of the story and our thoughts on how to make that more affordable. Next slide. I may not have to convince you that uh, the government's need for SATCOM in general and protected mill SATCOM specifically is growing. Our experience in combat teaches us that connectivity is king. The growth has been huge and has well outpaced our predictions. Government-owned SATCOM was unable to meet military demands in U.S. Central Command area of responsibility, but fortunately for us, the commercial SATCOM industry met most of the needs. That part of the world is on the unserved side of the digital divide. In Iraq, because before we sent troops in, we obliterated a relatively modern communica communications infrastructure. But in the case of Afghanistan, it really never existed. So SATCOM provided the core communications for our forces, and as we spent longer and longer in AFSATCOM, we brought some modern communications connectivity that uh, reduced the reliance on SATCOM and pushed that SATCOM capability further out to the pointy edge of the spear, providing more services at lower echelons of command. I don't think we'll see a much different equation as we rebalance forces to the Pacific. I mean, the last time I was in that part of the world, my cell phone stopped working at about the three mile out in the Pacific Ocean level. So we need to have SATCOM uh, in that theater, and SATCOM may even be more critical to success. And unlike our experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, we think there are potential adversaries in that part of the world that are not only willing but able to negate many of our SATCOM capabilities that are purpose-built to be protected. Obviously, we use communications and SATCOM for a number of purposes. Communications between humans, communications from humans to machines, and communications between machines. And if your eyes are really good, you'll see, you'll see that in my examples of machines, I have a soldier. The modern day soldier carries a lot of equipment, a lot of small machines as part of his gear, and some of those machines need to communicate, whether it be a retina scanner to identify friendly forces from unfriendly forces, or biometric sensors uh, on his uniform, or if he's a medic, tools that can get him back to a fully qualified doctor if he needs help in the field. Uh, so communications enables those machines and allows the soldier to do his job and if he or she doesn't have communications, they can't do their job as well, or perhaps not at all. Next chart. While the Department of Defense and its industry partners were able to focus on owned and leased commercial assets to provide a strong SATCOM network for current operations in Afghanistan, it wasn't a perfect system. I'm sure the debate will go on for many years about who got priority for SATCOM support. It was definitely good at brigade headquarters above, but frankly pretty sketchy out at the pointy edge of the spear. To the extent SATCOM was available at all to the individual soldier in small unit operations, it was low speed data or cell phone quality voice often shared among tens or hundreds of users. Perhaps more important that SATCOM was largely unprotected against modern day threats. It was vulnerable to interference and by the way, Improper configuration of user terminals frequently brought down a satellite network because improperly configured satellite terminals are jammers too. The terminals could be easily located through SIGIN assets. The networks relied on satellite hubs 
where physical damage or electrical power outage could bring down an entire network. Many people are worried about the jamming threat. It doesn't take a technically advanced enemy to jam most satellite uplinks. Lots of satellite jammers are deployed by our enemies, both big and fixed jammers, and mobile but capable jammers. But a much easier and longer lasting effect might be caused by a rocket launched into a SATCOM gateway, a cut cable between a remote terminal and a command center, or a cyber attack on the networking gear behind the satellite terminal. So my point on the left part of this chart is that we shouldn't worry only about jamming. We should be focused on all the threats and make a thoughtful determination on what threats to address in any SATCOM solution. On the right side of the chart, we are trying to differentiate between a couple of different dimensions of the threat problem. How easy it is for the enemy to cause an effect and the impact of the effect if the enemy is successful. Obviously, we want to stay at the red part of the box where it's easy to achieve the threat and the threat has large effects and may even be unattributable to an individual actor in the battle space. We certainly don't want to have a low-tech adversary being able to cause grave consequences in a future war. We also assert that the communications network is only as strong as its weakest link. It doesn't make sense to have a great anti-jam system if your ground infrastructure on which the network is dependent is an easy point to deny or degrade. As we pivot from Afghanistan to potential, to potential adversaries in the Pacific, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back about the successes of SATCOM and operations enduring freedom. That's Afghanistan. Looming adversaries in the Pacific are different. They have different intentions. They have very high technology capabilities, and they will want to degrade or eliminate our network-centric advantage very early in the game. Targeting the communications link links will be a good start, particularly if they are easy targets. Next chart. Today we have a mix of SATCOM capabilities. If you want to be well connected, you have to access all the satellites in view. While we link SATCOM together on the ground using network routers and other network hardware, having to span several SATCOM links through space in a series results in a significant time delay that makes some communications applications unsatisfactory. I'm sure you've all been overseas and talked on a cell phone call that goes over satellite links and you get confused and unsynchronized between the two parties of a communications and in a conference call, it's even worse. The same thing goes on video teleconferencing and both of these applications are important command and control capabilities for our forces. So some of these applications either don't work at all in the case of some computer to computer communications or they're very confusing on our brains that are used to instantaneous communications. Add to that, besides having to have four satellite terminals in this particular example, that three of these systems are likely to be under attack and either intermittent or completely shut down. My bottom line is that all critical communications, those that are essential for mission accomplishment, should migrate to protected SATCOM, whether they're sensors, command and control nodes, or air, maritime, or ground shooters. I already mentioned the mixed SATCOM systems we currently enjoy and how well it works in a benign environment, but is not necessarily efficient because multiple satellite links may be required to form a network. Here we see that the services necessary to support the mission are more expensive and require more ground equipment to glue the network together. Performance is reduced when we have to put satellite links end to end. And if you want to avoid these issues and be well connected, you have carry the burden of having four or more satellite terminals just to connect to the communications enterprise. Most of the network offers very little protection, and while there may be many satellite points of presence in view, tying them all together is complex. 
Lastly, while the cost of an individual link may not break your bank, having to use four links to get a job done is clearly more expensive than using one that does the whole job. Next chart. In North of Grumman, we've been building protected SATCOM payloads for more than 30 years. They were purposely designed and built to operate through government-specified threats from the low end of technology threat to the very highest level threats. We have a shelf full of components that are flight proven and known to mitigate the threats. Our program office has tested and characterized these components in every possible way. I like to think of these components consisting of antennas, electronics box, electronic cards, other hardware assemblies as a box of Legos. So we can take my box of Legos and we can build an advanced DHF satellite, and we're doing that. We just started the build of advanced DHF satellite uh, five and six at Redondo Beach. But we don't have to limit our imagination and the use of these components to a single satellite design that provides strategic and tactical communications. We can use these components in other ways to solve other communications problems. And a perfect example of that is we've built a, a system called the Enhanced Polar System, which is a scaled down version of an advanced DHF, completely compatible with advanced DHF terminals, but that we will fly on a uh, satellite host that flies in an orbit that provides coverage of the high latitudes, North Pole. And while there's not a lot of forces that operate out there, up there, there are forces that are operating that are far from their support bases and need protected satellite communications. And the Enhanced Polar System will do that. But it's more than providing communications for the North Pole. It demonstrates that we can take these LEGO components I just gave you pieces of and put them together in mission purposes, purpose ways without having to develop a new system and meet all requirements and be able to leverage the, the satellite terminals that are already part of the, the inventory. To be sure, tactical troops use the preponderance of MILSTAR and advanced DHF capability in terms of capacity and connections. That said, as needs for tactical protected communications grow, the needs for strategic communications are staying about the same. We should give more consideration to protected tactical SATCOM that may not have to incur all the features of a strategic system. This opens the possibility of using, for example, a commercial satellite bus that would be available from several different U.S. manufacturers. We can use a non-strategically survivable ground control infrastructure and a mission planning element. We can use non-strategic terminals, and we can use commercial launch. All this means new economies for a protected SATCOM enterprise. So we propose to build something called a protected tactical satellite system on a commercial bus, sized it so that we can use new commercial launch vehicles that are less expensive than the ones traditionally used by the Department of Defense missions, and configure it specifically to provide tactical communications. And I show you an example of taking parts, our Lego pieces, from the advanced DHF enterprise and configuring in a tactical free flyer system. This uh, system provides about 80% of the capacity 
of our advanced AHF satellite and costs about one third of the price of an advanced AHF satellite. So you can see it has strong leverage and I don't want to do a bait and switch on you. It's not an advanced DHF satellite. It's not hardened against all the threats that advanced DHF satellite are hardened against. What it does provide the tactical anti-jam protection, the low probability of intercept, low probability of detection, low probability of, uh, of exploitation that our advanced DHF waveform uses and, by the way, can utilize the same terminals. Once these tactical satellites are in production, their price is very close to the price of equivalent unprotected satellites. Furthermore, the ground segment is much less complicated because we propose to maintain advanced DHF crosslink modules in the system so that we can extend the point of presence from one satellite coverage area to the no another satellite coverage area. This gives us advantages in several dimensions, the first being that you don't rely on a vulnerable ground relay point to connect satellite coverage areas together. But in the end, on a life cycle cost basis, the crosslinks are actually cheaper than doing the same thing on the ground with all the O&M support and manpower required to operate those facilities and to protect them. The tactical protected network has a number of advantages. We only need a single U.S. ground station and a backup because the satellites that are out of view of a U.S. control location can be controlled via the crosslinks. We aren't reliant on overseas ground stations to manage the network and to present a lucrative target to adversaries. Moreover, users don't have to put up with performance impacts of relaying their communications over multiple satellite hops. And together, this tactical satellite service is about the same price as an equivalent unprotected system. But we can configure our LEGOs in other ways as well. You see two more examples on this chart. We could configure them as a smaller strategic satellite on a smaller strategic bus to eventually replenish the advanced DHF capability as it, re as it reaches end of life. Uh, a third interesting configuration is that we could use our receive our 10 beam receive uplink phased array uh, in a analog mode to exfiltrate hundreds of megabits of wideband data from UAVs in the line of sight of that satellite point of presence. These beams from that particular array are very, very narrow and can be shaped to avoid known interference. <coughs> The advantage in, of uh, being able to deliver protected system capabilities at the price of unprotected is that we can change the calculus of what communications we protect. Rather than rationing access to protected SATCOM, <coughs> excuse me, we can allocate it to all users that could experience mission failure if their communications links are degraded, disrupted, denied, or destroyed. We call these options for future EHF capability evolutionary EHF because we don't need to invent anything new. And consequently, we have very little non-recurring engineering content that can be hard to estimate and impact cost and schedule. Oh, thanks, Mike. Next slide. Oh, that's perfect. We can use this kind of modularity and ability to craft a new capability from proven components without starting a new development. We can pursue a vision of a unified communication systems where all core users can access a single system that is impervious to threats. We can place these payloads in a variety of orbits that complicates an adversary's ability to bring high-end threats of physical damage to platforms in view. This doesn't do away with other forms of SATCOM but it does unify essential command control and communications into a single threat-proof system that makes it possible for any user at any point on the globe to connect with any other user and via ground interconnection to all other users. That said, should, service for, should ground services become impaired, essential communications will be maintained. 
Next chart. So we find ourselves at a fork in the road. In one direction, communications is a force multiplier that operates through anticipated threats. In the other direction, we have a great system of systems in a benign environment but is vulnerable and may be degraded or denied by tech-savvy adversaries. We can make the decision to satisfy no needs, or we can let a patchwork of decisions as each sec sensor, shooter, and command and control communication system is fielded. They'll choose their own system, and the system will continue to be stovepiped and fractionated. We're dependent on communications to tie the key actors in the battle space together. We need to choose the right course of action. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, Pat Host with Defense Daily. Uh, what exactly is the, uh, the platform you guys, you said you created for this, the solution? So this particular ta uh, satellite uses a, uh, a commercial medium-sized satellite bus and the payload was specifically uh, sized to be able to be launched on a SpaceX launcher, a commercial launcher. So uh, we picked the maximum size we could uh, fly on the cheapest launcher, basically. And buses like that are available from companies throughout the US. I don't think I'll name names, but there are more than three that can supply them. Uh, Stu Magnuson with National Defense Magazine. Every time I've seen this uh, Space Con Command uh, official speak in the last six months, they're saying we, we're not going to start any new development uh, programs. Uh, what, what's your understanding of the Air Force's interest in this? Uh, I know you said this isn't new development, but it would be a new constellation. Are you, you're asking them to buy these satellites and launch them themselves, right? Well, it's a natural evolution of both advanced DHF mm -hmm. and enhanced polar system, both of which are programs of record in the Air Force's space portfolio. Uh, I'm not going to get into acquisition details. I don't know how the Air Force would choose to migrate incrementally towards a solution like this. They may not even like the solution, uh, but this is not a new program. It's components that the Department of Defense has invested billions of dollars in that are flying today, we just configure them in a different way, much the same way as we did the enhanced polar system. Have you considered a business case where you launch them yourself and sell the services, or would that be something you would consider? Well, that's not our typical business case, uh, but if the, a customer would guarantee return on investment over the life cycle of a lease, it certainly makes sense to me, and I suspect that not only would uh, I mean, there'd be many people that would be willing to buy these products and manage a network like that. I mean, the commercial satellite operators of the world do this for a living. And their big complaint on the DOD way of buying SATCOM is you can't buy it one year at a time and influence our buying decisions. You have to buy it long term. But I mean, this is not, you know, this is a cheaper system, but it's going to require a long term commitment to pay for it. Amy Butler with Aviation Week. I'm just curious, um, you mentioned that you're already working on Enhanced Polar, you're working on AEHF 5 and 6. Reasonably speaking, how quickly do you think something like this could gain traction? I mean, are we talking three, four years out? Uh, I would think the most likely decision point is the point at which the United States Air Force has to decide on what to do about Satellite 7 and 8. And I, I hate to be picky about this, but the cost of the advanced DH satellites have, has varied wildly because of federal funding and whatnot. When you say it's 80% of the cost, do you mean of AEHF 1, AEHF 3? Five and six. Okay, okay. <coughs> uh, Aaron, Matt of Defense News. I just wanted to quickly clarify. Have you guys talked to the Air Force about this, or is this all theoretical? Oh, absolutely, extensively. 
And what's the reaction then? Well, they don't need to make a decision today. They're uh, considering a number of ways to solve the shortfall that they understand they have as well. And uh, we'll continue talking. So I'm curious, um, what, what, if any, impact there is to your relationship with Lockheed? Obviously, you still have a relationship with Lockheed to produce payloads for however many advanced EHF satellites the Air Force wants to pr procure. But at the same time, it, it appears that you're presenting yourself as a prime contractor for what would be this smaller tactical system. So how does that work out business relationship-wise with Lockheed? Do they get a piece of any of this? So we have a great relationship with Lockheed Martin. We have welcomed, you know, supplying payloads for them for some 32 years. And uh, we think there's uh, plenty of opportunity in, set, in solving this problem for all of us. But, but you are presenting yourself as a client for the tactical. And we're talking to Lockheed Martin as well. Oh, so it's not in stone. Well, keep in mind, you have to, we have to maintain the strategic constellation. And if you look at the number of players, in that particular area today, there is one. So let me just make sure I'm but I'm not going to discuss in, in detail you know, our possible vi business ventures uh, in the future. Well, when we're writing about this, to be clear, should we say this is a larger concept? The, the tactical piece with the medium-sized satellite for a SpaceX launcher, is that a Northrop initiative or is that a Northrop Lockheed initiative? It's definitely a Northrop initiative, Northrop government initiative. But you can ask Lockheed Martin, and if they want to steal it, we're happy with that. Sorry, just clarify one more point. Uh, these are going to be dedicated DOD satellites, or are they going to be shared with public groups or companies? Uh, so our hope would be that a tactical capability would be shared by at least our best coalition partners and allies, because it's really important that their communications be as bulletproof as ours is when we're going about a mission uh, together. But this is not a commercial class of communication services. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, protected and has cyber features that in general aren't going to be in the open market. Thank you for your time.